Greetings. The Lord is with you. It's good to be with you this evening. I'm Pastor Bob Quaintance. <clears throat> I'm the pastor of Good Hope Lutheran Church in Boardman, Ohio, a suburb of Youngstown. And I'm glad to uh, be with you tonight teaching on Matthew chapter 10 as we take one chapter a day uh, through the New Testament. We began in, in uh, uh, January and we're traveling through. Uh, we'll soon be a third of the way through the year. Um, we begin as we make the sign of the cross and we say together we are under the care of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, Priscilla. Good to see that you're on. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, devotion. So let's have a, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together in your word tonight. As you send the disciples out with advice as they go on their first training mission on their own, they've been watching Jesus, and now you're sending them out. Lord, send us out uh, with hearts to do the work that you have called us to do and to not be sidetracked. Um, help this word to speak into us um, a, a desire wherever we are to do that work. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> uh, good to be with you again. We are tonight in in Matthew chapter 10. <clears throat> this uh, uh, first section was chapter 1 through 3, introduction. 4 through 7 was uh, the first section as he began to explain the kingdom of God and uh, have the first great teaching, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Here, the kingdom of God has been breaking into the lives of people, uh, three sets of three, and in between those three sets, uh, calls to discipleship. And here we have tonight the great teaching that ends this section, all uh, basically all of chapter 10. Um, and uh, so uh, we ended last night in chapter 9 with Jesus um, out again preaching, uh, teaching, and healing. And we heard he had compassion on the crowds because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he told the disciples to pray that the Lord would send out laborers into his vineyard. I think that's wonderful and funny because they're going to be praying for God to send somebody out to help these people, and then God calls them. <laughs> Here we go, chapter 10. And he called to him his 12 disciples and uh, gave them, he'd been calling people, many are following him, but 12 were apostles or disciples, uh, and he's calling them out and listing them here and giving them authority. Remember the centurion, one of the lists of three people, uh, understood that he himself was a man under authority and he saw that Jesus was under the authority of God, and he spoke for God. Well, Jesus uh, called to him the 12 disciples, said, come here. And when they came, he gave them authority. Some of that authority of the Father, they now have the authority of Jesus, who's under the authority of the Father. He gave them authority over unclean clean spirits to cast them out, to heal every disease and every affliction. Um. So uh, I just love that praise. He gave them authority. They, um, they represent uh, the Father in all they're doing. And the names, then we have the names. And whatever list of disciples we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Peter always uh, brings up the list at the beginning, and Judas always uh, uh, finishes the list at the end. Uh, good evening, Shirley. I see you're on as well. Um, so uh, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Remember, they were fishermen, and Jesus called them to leave their, their boats and nets, and he would teach them to fish for people. Then he called um, um, uh, Philip and Bartholomew and Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, which, uh, according to Mark and Luke, may be called uh, Judas, uh, not Iscariot, Judas, son of James. 
Uh, then Simon the Zealot, two Simons, Peter, and then Simon known as the Zealot, um, and uh, Judas Iscariot of the town of Cariot, um, who betrayed him. He caused the 12 disciples to him, and he gave them authority. He, by the power of God, told them what they were to do. They had the authority to cast out demons and to heal every disease. And now he teaches them, beginning here at verse 5, through the end of the chapter. You know that you're done with the one of these five great teachings in Matthew because it always ends with the phrase, when Jesus had finished instructing. Well, that's the very beginning of verse 1 of chapter 11, when Jesus had finished instruction, instructing. We saw that in chapter 7, um, when the Sermon on the Mount was over. I'm turning to it right now. Uh, second to last verse in chapter 7, and when Jesus had finished these sayings. Uh, so uh, the crowd marveled at what he taught. So here, chapter 10, verse 5 through the end. These 12 Jesus sent out. First he gave them authority, and then he sent them out, um, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles. Now later on Jesus is going to send 70 out, but but here it's just the 12 that he's sending out um, on a little missionary journey, a practice session. He's been teaching them. They've been listening to him preaching, teaching, and healing. And now it's time for them to practice uh, what they've been learning. He trusts them to do this. He trusts you to put into practice uh, what he's been teaching you. Uh, we don't wait till we're fully credentialed. We do on-the-job training in, in discipleship. These 12 he sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Just it's an aside. It's one of the two scriptures that Jesus uh, really spoke into my heart when I was back in my uh, uh senior year of high school to confirm for me that he was calling me to be an ordained pastor. Out of, out of God's word came my call. And it had to be tested, and many hurdles uh, had to be uh, gone over, many doors had to open up for me to become a pastor. But uh, it began here. Uh, in, in two verses of Scripture, this is one of them. Um, uh, God calling the twelve to be sent out. And and to not go all over the place, not to the Gentiles, not to the Samaritans, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And I always understood that as, as I had gained so much in my relationship with Christ that was more than just doing church or going to church or enjoying going to church, but that Jesus Christ had become so very real in my life that I want to have other people have that real life-giving relationship with Jesus. I see uh, uh, Joyce is on. Hello to you, and I see you're saying hi to everyone. So uh, good evening to the whole crew that's 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 coming on. Um, but my heart's desire is to help people have a vital, life-giving, real relationship with God, and not just up in here, but in one's heart and one's whole life. Um, and, and it be began with this Bible passage. So it's, uh, it's uh, uh, again, one of my favorites uh, because I, I see how God used it in my life. And now it took me um, from that senior year in high school, four years of college and four years of seminary, and now 41 and three quarter years of being a pastor. So quite a few years ago, about 50 years ago, uh, almost this call came to me in, in uh, probably somewhere late uh, 1972. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Um, this is just the beginning of their mission. They're going to go to the Gentiles. They will go to the Samaritans. But right now, as they're beginning, he, he focuses among the Jews. That's not his forever word, but it's his word right now. As you're beginning, go here to the house of Israel and proclaim. Uh, again, we are people of the word. Uh, John the Baptist came preaching. Jesus came preaching. 
the disciples are sent out to proclaim a message. We are people of a word. We are called to share God's love tangibly, but we are called to tell the story of God's love. Uh, And we can practice that with one another. Great way to practice is becoming a Sunday school teacher uh, to learn uh, to share God's love or become a, a small group leader. And proclaim as you go saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, that was how he began. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so we just say what Jesus said. We share the words of Jesus. What else? Well, then we're to make tangible the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. What you saw Jesus do, you go ahead and do that. You have God's authority to do that. Amazing. You received without paying, give without pay. Here in this missionary journey now, later on, there to be a, the, the worker is worthy of his wages, and he's going to say that in a moment. But don't worry. Um, you don't worry about getting paid. You worry about giving. God will take care of you. Obviously, they will have needs, but God will meet those needs. You focus not on meeting your own needs, but you focus on the work that I've given you to do. As he taught us in the first great teaching, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else you need will be given to you. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff. Don't spend a lot of time getting ready to go. You will never be ready. You will never have enough. If your feeling is, I got to get more, so I'm prepared for every eventuality. If you have God with you, if you are convinced he is sending you, you have everything you need because his blessings will be there. For uh, acquire none of these things because... The laborer deserves his food. Um, If you're out doing God's work, God will see that you would be reimbursed. Um, The the laborer deserves his wages, and God will see that there are people who give the wages what are necessary to you when you're doing work. And this isn't just about being a pastor. This is about fulfilling the calling to which God has called you. If God has called you to a certain calling, perhaps it's being a teacher. Uh, Perhaps it's being a secretary. Perhaps it's being a social worker or a counselor. Uh, Perhaps it's being a mother or a housewife, um, staying at home, working there. If God has called you to it, God will provide your needs. If you are laboring for him, He will see that your needs are met. The laborer deserves his wages. We ought always, if we're the business owner, be paying a fair wage, a competitive wage. But when it comes to worrying about ourselves, we seek God first, do God's work, and he will take care of us. And whatever time, he'll put people in our ways who will provide for our needs. And whatever town or village you enter, uh, first... Find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. Don't be moving around from house to house. Uh, Find someone who's worthy. Someone who is worthy is someone who's open to the word of God and willing to support that word of God. If they're inviting you to their house, stay with them. Remember Paul in his missionary journeys. He came to Philippi and Lydia imposed on him saying, no, please stay with me. He did. It's, It's really that simple. Um, as you enter the house, greet it. (laughs) Greet the home. That's an interesting thought. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. I think the house is the same kind of thought as that we would use for a home. Not so much the building, but, but the family within the building and the culture, the environment within those four walls and under that roof. If this house is worthy, find a worthy Um, when you go find out who is worthy in it and stay there. And if this house is worthy, 
let your peace come upon him. Your peace. What if you, as a Christian, were so confident in God and so unworried about yourself that you were filled with, with peace? Um, that will pass on to others. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. Let your peace just flow from you into the lives of others. Be an agent of peace. Not so much trying to give people peace, but just being at peace in yourself and letting that peace overflow into others. Um, I think of, of uh, Psalm 23. Uh, whether I'm in green pastures or dark valleys, the Lord is with me. And in the midst of my enemies, you prepare a table before me, my cup runneth over. Let your peace run over into the lives of others. And if, and, and, but if the house is not worthy, let your peace return to you. Don't get riled up. Stay at peace within yourself. It'll overflow to others if they don't want it. That's okay. Let it return to you. Don't, don't let that uh, anxiety come into your life. Let your peace come back in. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, this would be in that town, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, I, I think that's more like an idiom. Um, could you wave your shoe? Yes, you could. In fact, throwing one's shoe or sandal at someone is the epitome of ridicule. It happened to President Bush one time from a reporter um, from a Middle Eastern country. It was a, a major sign of disrespect. Um, uh, so it, it is probably a, a word that's culturally relevant um, at that time uh, or in that place of the world. If anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Um, in other words, don't stay there. Um, move on. Uh, Jesus did that with that word withdraw that we find here in Matthew's gospel. He often moved on. Um, don't just have to stay locked horns with someone. Time to move on. God will send someone else to them. Shake the dust off of your feet and when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Wow. Uh, that's because Sodom and Gomorrah did not have Jesus coming and did not have the 12 disciples who were the, had the authority of Jesus. And, and so, yes, these towns that had Christ in it or the disciples will have a harder time explaining why they didn't turn to faith. Well, that was his um, first word. His first word was, Go, and I will provide for your needs. Don't you worry about that. You do the work of proclaiming the message and healing the sick and casting out demons, raising the dead, and uh, uh, cleansing the lepers. Then I'll take care of your needs. The second word is about um, a, a word of warning. You're going to face persecution. Opposition is going to come. Just be absolutely certain of that. Uh, following Jesus does not mean things are going to be wonderful, as opposed to the um, the, the preachers uh, who preach the, the health and wealth gospel, that if you're a follower of Jesus, you'll always be healthy and you'll always be wealthy. No. Uh, they do that to have you give money so that they can get their own jet airplanes. But that's not Jesus. So verse 16, the second section, if you're a follower of Jesus, first of all, you're going to face opposition. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. It's hard to do both. Um, we need God's wisdom to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves because we are just like sheep in the midst of wolves. Not one wolf in the midst of a herd of sheep, a flock of sheep, we are sheep in the midst of a herd or flock or whatever of wolves, a pack. That's the word. Um, 
I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. That's a, a picture really of Jesus, I think. Beware of men, for they will deliver you, and this is the opposition you'll face. I think we can just run through this. They will deliver you over to the courts and flog you in the synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. Uh, before governors, kings, Gentiles, you're going to be sent to prison, but for, for my sake, to bear witness to them. This is all part of the plan of God. So when you're imprisoned, when you're stuck and, and waiting trial before a king or, or, or a ruler, I've got you there. See God's hand and God's purpose. Don't look at the opposition as something just to run from, although we do shake the dust of our, off our feet. But when, when you're facing opposition, look for what God is doing. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you will speak or what you will say. For what you will say um, will be given you in that hour. That the Holy Spirit will come upon you and guide your words. So don't worry about it. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who is speaking through you. How bad will it be? Well, it will happen right in your family. Brother will deliver up brother over to death, and father his child. And children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my sake, namesake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Well, we're going to find a corollary to this in just uh, uh, near the end of the, the message. So I'll, I'll just keep going. You'll be hated by all for my sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Now, that's a statement. So does that mean before he, on this one trip, uh, he, he's going to come following up and they won't, won't have gotten through all the towns before he follows up? Perhaps. Um, is it something about their call to keep on going until he comes again at the end of time? Perhaps. Um, I'm not quite sure fully how to take that phrase but it might have nuances, as Scripture often does, of both. Um, he's going to come and follow up. Uh, you won't have finished your work before he comes to follow up the first time, or you won't have finished your work before he comes again at the end of time. So your job is to keep going, even in the face of opposition, keep proclaiming the kingdom and, and raising the dead and, and healing the sick. Continuing this theme of opposition, he says, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. So if they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, and they do that in chapter 9, we saw that verse 34, how much more will they malign those of his household? I'm sending you out, Jesus is saying. You will face, as, as I have faced opposition so also you will face opposition. First section, God will provide. Don't worry about providing for yourself. Keep focused on your calling. Secondly, uh, persecution and opposition will come. Um, keep your eye on your calling. And uh, then thirdly, have no fear. I love this section. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. I, I love this because we're told what we should fear. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim in the housetops. Don't be afraid. Just do your job of proclaiming the kingdom's message. And do not fear those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul. <laughs> That's the persecution part. Don't be afraid of people who can kill your body. Their soul is going to end up in hell. Yours will not. If you're not to fear people who can kill you, who should you fear? 
Oh, glad you asked. Rather fear him, middle of verse 28, rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's God. If you're going to be afraid of somebody, don't be afraid of people who can kill you. Be afraid of God. Fear God who could send you to hell. Then this wonderful passage about fearing God. Here's Jesus' teaching. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Two sparrows sold for one penny. Yet not one of them, a half a penny's worth, will light to the ground without the father's knowledge. He's intimately aware of every detail of his creation. Mind-boggling thought. But he is. He's intimately aware of your situation today. Not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. God knows you intimately. He counts the hairs on your head. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So don't be afraid of people who can kill you. If you're going to be afraid of somebody, be afraid of God. But then he's the one who cares for the sparrows and counts your hair, the hair on your head. <laughs> you don't need to be afraid of him. Fear God, the one whom you do not need to be afraid of. For you are of more value to him than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father in, in heaven on that judgment day. Don't worry. Whoever denies me before men, like those Pharisees who say that he's acting by the power of the devil, uh, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven, uh, in that they never knew him. And he'll go, yep, they never knew me. And I never knew them. Final section. Why is he sending us out? And what are we to do? Well, do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth. The goal isn't being a, a, a person who gets everybody to get along. There's a higher goal than that. Peace is a good thing, but there's a higher calling. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Uh, God does not first of all seek that you make everything okay for everybody in your family or at work. Here's the principle then. W what are we to do? If we're not just to make everybody happy around us, uh, what are we to do? Well, here's the clear message. Whoever loves father or mother more than me, remember, father will turn in children, children will turn in father, brothers will turn in each other. But whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus is to be first. That's the calling. We don't try and please people. We try and please God. We don't fear people. We fear God. Of course, we don't need to be afraid of him, but we reverence and honor him. Or as the first commandment says, you shall have no other gods. And Martin Luther's meaning to it is, we are to fear and love, God, fear, love and trust God above anything else. So, Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus is first. And whoever, and he doesn't even say God, not worthy, no, more than me. It's our love for Jesus. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life, gives it up, and not holding on to his life. Jesus did that, left heaven, and let go, uh, did not grasp hold of everything it meant to be God, but he humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death. So we are called to follow him. 
deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. To uh, deny our self-will, seeking God's will in every decision. To take up our cross, um, crucifixion is a shocking metaphor for discipleship in Jesus' day. But take up your cross. Come to where you will be abused. Uh, you will die for God's will. Come, whoever does not take up his cross, this, this symbol of obedience to the Father, even to death on the cross, and follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. This is the movement of a Christian. This is the movement of a disciple as he sends them out. Here's your focus. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. God will provide. Don't worry about yourself. God will provide. Um, in the face of opposition, you will face it. But don't be afraid. Trust God and his love for you. <clears throat> Whoever receives you, receives me. And whoever receives me, uh, this is, uh, there will be people who, who, who help you. God will bless them. Whoever receives you will receive me. And whoever receives him who sent me, the one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones uh, even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I show, he will, not, he will by no means lose his reward. Jesus will take it personally when people bless you. It will be like they're blessing him, and he will pour out his blessing on them. What a wonderful word uh, at the end of where he began, saying, don't worry about your needs. God will take care of you. And when people help you, he will help them. <laughs> what a blessing. Well, thank you for joining with me. Uh, tonight's Wednesday night. Tomorrow night is Thursday night, and we'll be in Matthew 10 and Friday, excuse me, Matthew 11, and in Friday, Matthew 12. We'll be beginning this third section of the teachings, uh, the, the, the third of the five great teachings in Matthew's gospel. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, you call us to follow you. You send us out. Lord, help us to go proclaiming and caring. The two ways we as a church have to share the gospel. Lord, help us to be ever more faithful here at Good Hope in doing proclaiming and caring so that people might come to faith. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining with me tonight. And remember, I'll see you tomorrow. Remember, God loves you, and so do I. Bye-bye.